Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday, Monday Mindset, Mindset Podcast. Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 115 or 115. I still can't decide which way to go. <laughs> <laughs> And today, it's Terry's turn to share something with us. What have you got for us today, Terry? Well, Daisy, I'm circling back to one that I haven't done in a little while. And it is from the Mind Valley podcast with Vishen Lakiani. Uh-huh. And it is called Four Steps to Emotional Agility with best-selling author Susan David. As I did a little bit of research about her, she is a Harvard Medical School psychologist and she is originally from South Africa. And years ago, she did a TED Talk that has had 8 million views. Wow. Very popular one. And she has a book called Emotional Agility. And it's a very popular book, has received all kinds of acclaim from various sources. So I thought, interesting, because I've never really followed her. And I know, Daisy, you had shared something from her quite a while back. I think so, but I can't remember exactly what. And uh, whatever it was, even if we overlap, it will be a slightly different perspective. That's right. And I do remember her things as being really interesting. And I, I've got a feeling I get her newsletter, actually. Ah. Well, the topic really was kind of set up to be how to thrive in an uncertain world by becoming more emotionally agile. And as we both know, as you get into some of these podcasts, they start off with these kind of lofty goals of this is what they're going to cover. And all of a sudden they're in a, a crunch in the last five minutes to actually cover mm. the four steps of how to do this or whatever. But it was still get very all the interesting. talking points out from their latest book. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> But um, Vishen asked her a little bit of like why she got in so interested in emotional agility. And she talked about from a very young age, living in South Africa, and she described it living in a country that was so committed to apartheid, the experiences that exposed her to and the realities that it exposed her to just made human emotion and trying to make sense of things and make sense of emotions became so important to her. And then when she was about 15, her father was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And she remembers like on a Friday, her mom said, well, you need to go in and say goodbye to dad and, you know, went into the room. And one of the things she said about him that is a uh, theme in her work is she remembers, although he was lying there with his eyes closed, she remembers feeling seen by him. And she said that was such an important thing that she always felt seen by him. And her theme then is that emotional agility is really about seeing and unseeing self and others and being seen by others, your true emotions. And she used an example of, you know, some of the toxic positivity or forced positivity where you're really taught to ignore your internal experience. So on a Friday, she was told to go in and say goodbye to her dad. And then on Monday, her mom was trying to just keep things going and have three kids. And so went back to school on Monday and just kind of that pressure to almost ignore what you're actually experiencing mm. and just act like everything's Carry on fine. As normal. Yeah. Mm. So she credits something really important at that stage in her life to a teacher who handed out a journal at the beginning of school and said, write, tell the truth you know, write what's really going on. So Dr. Susan David said at this point, she had a revelation that for her, she was going to stop pretending to be okay and to really show up for herself and be in her own truth. She talks about the idea that we have kind of these five core emotions that we carry with us through life. And she branches off at this point and says, you know, this is not a theory that I came up with of these core emotions, but really she talked about Charles Darwin, talked about the importance of emotions, and he proposed that emotions serve a purpose and that they're really a foundational component of us creating our ability to adapt to a complex environment, that our emotional responses help us know how to react and create 
healthy responses. So those five emotions are anger, fear, disgust, contempt, and sadness. And what she really covers in this talk and in her book, Emotional Agility, is how to use these emotional experiences to help guide us. And I think in your episode with her, it was referring to signposts and using these emotional experiences as kind of directives, signposts that tell you where you need to go and what you need at that point and letting that inform you. So for example, she talked about then what good does it do us to have these difficult emotions? And she said that she really doesn't believe in the categorization of emotions as either positive emotions or negative emotions, that really all emotions are just the signposts. They are things to help guide us. Mm. And they help us to know something about our needs and come to know our values. So for example, anger is an emotion, she says, that we feel when something that we value is being threatened. And she used the example of Nelson Mandela in her home country, that it was the anger he experienced with the injustice that was occurring all around him and in his own life that prompted him to do something about it and take action and speak with his oppressors and, and work on a system talked about fear as one of those primary emotions and that this is really gears us toward protection, helps us know what our needs are and that we can find what we are protecting. Um, Again, means it's something of value to us. Vision then talked about the word disgust and he said in some way it kind of protects us even from like our own, the way he described it, it's almost like from your own vomit, like protecting yourself and learning what is it that disgusts me and Do I avoid that to avoid this potential harm? The next one is contempt. And that this, she described this as a social emotion, that it has to do with others. It's not just being the recipient of something and feeling angry about it internally, but it is having contempt in a relationship with another and experiencing a dynamic of feeling disconnected or socially distanced from this person because of their values or their behavior or whatnot. Yes, it pretty well has to have somebody else involved. I was just thinking about that, the difference between disgust and contempt. You, you, can, feel, you can feel disgust with others, but you can feel self-disgust. But I was just thinking, as you were saying that, can you direct contempt at yourself? And it's, I would have thought it's almost always involving someone else or other people. I do hear some people talk about self-contempt, but if you think about it, it's really pitting yourself against yourself. It's distancing and disconnecting from aspects of yourself. Is it still making that disconnection? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And then sadness, she referred to that really as being about loss, that something important to me is being lost. And that is where sadness comes in. One of the things that I really liked that she pointed out during this discussion is she said that emotions are data. They're not directives. And oftentimes, many of us have learned to experience our emotions as directives. I'm angry, I should do this. I'm upset, I have to eat this. That those emotions tell us that the response has to be immediate. There is a direct result of this versus it's data that we can use to help understand our values, our needs, and she referred to them as signals, which help us to know which way to go in situations, what action to take, um, where to go in in our next steps. Yeah, I suppose that's where all this, where this theory of signposts and things mm-hmm. come in, signals and signposts, and yeah, it's not emotions, it's information. Mm-hmm you then work out all these things like you say it doesn't we tend to have this need for Mm -hmm. direct action as a result emotions action got to act on it that's right (laughs) and and i think we've learned to justify our actions based on the emotion that was um underneath it and depending on the emotion generated i think a lot of us have learned haven't we 
the old, yeah, you know, sleep on it before you send that mm -hmm. email as a reaction to the emotion that's been stirred up as a response. Absolutely. <laughs> a lot of us have learned the value of that little bit of time as buffer. <laughs> Absolutely. She talked about an example of an emotion like boredom. And as she described it, she made boredom sound really unpleasant. And I think, gosh, I so rarely feel bored. <laughs> um, you and I were just talking before we started recording all the ways that we distract ourselves and use up time. So I don't usually sit around feeling bored. But she used this as an example that even boredom that can feel really uncomfortable, it helps us to see when we need more challenge in our lives, when we need something, we need change or challenge, something more to do, something new to learn or to take on. She talked about grief and she said that really grief is love looking for a home, kind of helps us to recall what we had. And it's, it's, she describes it almost like it's that other person or thing kind of saying, don't forget me, remember what we had together as, as important to you. She talked about feeling loneliness as signaling a greater need for intimacy or connection and really kind of a gentle way of saying, see me and wanting to be seen. She talked about the idea that there's this concept of display rules and that we learn rules about expressing our emotions, whether expressing or demonstrating emotion is okay if it's warranted, if it's invited, and are there certain emotions that are invited and certain emotions that are not. And if we grow up in an environment where emotions are very welcomed, we develop emotional skills, learning that emotions pass, that we experience them, and then they pass. We can learn a sense of experiencing our emotions without fearing them because they're not dangerous. And we learn to be attuned to our emotions. So again, these are the emotional skills that come out of an environment where emotions are welcomed. Mm, and being encouraged to process them. Yeah. And understand them and figure out what those signposts are. Mm -hmm. But so many of us instead grow up in situations where emotions are not accepted or um, feel very dangerous. Mm. So let's say, for example, if you grow up in a, a family where someone is very volatile, a parent or an older sibling is very volatile, you become fearful of your own anger because you see how dangerous it is. You know what it's like to be on the receiving end. You see what happens when someone's angry. And so you learn that it's dangerous. And so you learn to become avoidant or dismissive of your own emotional experiences. You downplay them, ignore them don't express them. So from this point of their discussion about emotions and how we kind of develop and learn rules about expressing them and whatnot, she then moves into a brief description of the four concepts of emotional agility, which you can learn in her TED Talk or in her book. But she refers to these four concepts as showing up, stepping out, walking your why, and moving on. So as you and I have experienced sometimes in listening to these, they spent a good bit of time on the first step and then had to quickly go through the others. But I really like the first one. So the first one again is showing up. And she describes this really as an acceptance of all of your emotions without judging them, um, accepting your, actually she refers to other parts of ourselves too, our emotions, our stories, and our thoughts that these kind of make up our experiences. And without judging them or resisting them, just opening your heart to the signals of what they're showing you and having compassion for yourself, regardless of what the emotion is. She referred to a South African or a Zulu word that is sawubona, and it means I see you. And so basically to bring something into being. Mm. And as her theme is, I see you. I see myself and accepting that and how much better we can interact and connect being seen and seeing others. So she uses that phrase often in this part of this podcast, but she then talks about the, the importance of accepting all of our emotions 
and she refers to a quote by Viktor Frankl, who, if people have not followed him at all or read his work before, he was a Holocaust survivor. And he has a quote that basically says something like, between stimulus and response, there's a space. And in this space, we have the power to choose. And in this choice is where our true power and growth come from. So rather than the immediate stimulus response, my boss was being a jerk, I had to eat a muffin, (laughs) that there's a space in between where we can really find our power and, and check in with ourselves. But she says, when we're hooked in by the emotional response, there is no space. And that is, again, where we get into that emotion and then the response. Uh, yeah, interesting. So the space bit is important. Mm-hmm. I'm impressed you, you actually have physical notes on a piece of paper like me this uh, week. It's like the first time in a long time, <laughs> right? Um, she uses an example here, and she describes her son, coming home from school and saying, Johnny didn't invite me to his birthday party. Now I'm not going to invite him. So I'm hurt. Mm. I'm mad. So I'm going to act. I'm not going to invite him. And that we can do so much help in a situation like this by acknowledging friendships are really important to you and that hurt your feelings that you didn't get invited. It's not just the anger. There are other feelings there that he's experiencing. And if you can help them kind of acknowledge that, or if we can help ourselves to accept all of our feelings, then we can get to what is the next step. So there's that space in between the emotion and the response. And this is where she used the word in this podcast, what does this signpost to you? What does this tell you? What is of value to you? And what do you need to do with this information? The next step is stepping out. And this is a part where she talks about kind of creating some distance between us and what we are feeling. And she talked about language and that oftentimes we say things like, I am stressed. Like I, all of me, my whole being is stressed. And to start using more accurate labels, digging into what that first word means, what else are you feeling? Like I'm feeling depleted and unsupported that that's actually even more accurate than just stressed. So being able to dig into a little bit. And then also she talked about creating that distance. And you and I have talked about this in another episode before, but rather than saying, I am angry, Mm. again, all of me, that is my full experience right now. Mm. It's my identity. It's everything I am. Yeah, That's right. Versus I notice that I'm feeling angry. Or maybe it's about a thought. I'm noticing this is my I'm not enough thought process. Distancing ourselves a little bit from it, looking at it as it is not all of us, but it is part of our experience can help us choose where to go with it differently, use the information that it brings us. It makes me think of, I don't know if you have them in the States. Do you have the Mr. Men? The what? The Mr. Men, it's a series of little they're, they're little square books. I don't know whether they've ended up, they must have ended up on TV. But the Mr. Men, so, and, th- th- and that's what it made me think of. I have a feeling they, they haven't traveled across the pond, but they are emotions. So there is a Mr. Angry and, you know, and they all look different. They're usually a sort of a, you know, a shape. So I think angry is a sort of a red spiky. And then they've got the little legs and the little arms. And it's, you know, there'll be the, the Mr. Men book. There'll be Mr. Angry and it'll be Mr. Angry story. And they're all the, the different. There's, you know, little Miss Happy and all they all have their story. But that just it just made me think of that when you said that, you know, the difference between yeah, I I am angry. I am anger. I am Mr. Angry. It is everything. Mm-hmm. It describes who I am. And I just pictured the Mr. Men, you know, mm-hmm. it is their whole being. That is who they are rather than, yeah, I'm feeling angry or I'm actually going to delve in deeper and get better with my language and mm-hmm. dissect that anger into actually what it is. And even going back to the other example of I'm noticing this is my I'm not enough thought, many of us might just start stating that as fact. Clearly, I'm not enough for this person. So 
versus, oh, I'm noticing I'm having a thought that I may not be enough right now. It's interesting because they also talked about Vision brought in the example of the movie Inside Out. Oh, yes, yes. Disney movie Mm -hmm. where the, you know, recognizing the different emotions that can be going on at the same time and just talked about what a great movie that is to help people recognize the complexity. Yeah. And when they agree to work together, it becomes harmonious. Mm -hmm. So the third, she referred to these not only as kind of steps, but she referred to these as practices that we do. So walking your why. So connecting with our values, this helps to ground us to our internal core. And she didn't go into a lot of detail here. As I said, they were kind of hurrying through these last That's five few. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> We've got one minute left. What else? And then the last practice being moving on, taking action based on the wisdom that we've gained from observing and paying attention to our emotions and seeing them. So for example, if the emotional response that I'm having is loneliness, it helps me to recognize I'm feeling disconnected. And she walked through an example. Let's say you're living with a spouse and you're very disconnected. They're on their phone. You're doing things on your own. You're always, you know, just kind of missing each other. And she said, you know, if you're recognizing and paying attention to this loneliness, recognizing that you can take action on it. So disconnection is the issue. So maybe when you walk through the living room and the spouse is on the phone that you just reach over and touch them on the shoulder. So you you do something to create some more connection. And just a, a great example of so often it's easy to get caught in the emotion. I'm lonely. We're so disconnected. I don't even feel like we know each other anymore but we don't do something about it. Mm. So I think this step is so important of letting that inform you, creating some distance. I'm not lonely. I'm experiencing loneliness. I'm I'm recognizing I'm not connected enough with this person that I want to be connected to. And then that's an important value to me. And so I'm going to take action. I'm going to reach out and touch them when I walk through the room. So just they walked through a, a quick example like that. That thread seems to come through in so many things. It's that that first step is awareness and just creating a little bit of distance from the raw, from the rawness of the emotion you're feeling. And awareness without those first steps, however they're described. You know, she has her approach. As you were talking about different things, there were echoes of things we've talked about from Brene Brown mm-hmm. and you know, you, but you have to recognize these things before you can then take that next step, the active step of doing something about it. You know, I was thinking as you were using that example of feeling lonely in a relationship, there are so many ways that you could take that next step. You know, we, we all have, I turn to Google for almost anything and it's it's almost a joke, but you could, couldn't you? Once you've recognized the issue and recognized that there's potentially something you can do about it, we have so many resources at our fingertips now to then give you ideas of what you could do about it because you could feel lost about not knowing what steps to take, can't you? But mm-hmm. that, once you've sort of got to that point, in all, that seems to be the biggest hurdle really. Once you're there, you're sort of on the on the downward slope and it's probably a bit easier to find the answers mm-hmm. or some suggestions anyway to what steps you could make to improve the situation. And I think you're highlighting a piece that I kind of took from this too. It's the difference between having an emotional response and reacting to it versus giving ourselves pause, a reflection time to create an action from it. To take action from it is is fine, but it's not just a tip-off reaction. Mm. So got an email that really annoyed me, walked to the fridge and ate a candy bar. Mm. That's just a reaction. Technically, eating that candy bar has nothing to do with what's going on with that emotional response, but we've learned to react. And we've learned to react with something that we think calms us or soothes us or gives us relief. 
versus, as you said, it's really learning what is the thing that I'm needing here and how can I take action on that? Mm. So for example, they talked about righteous anger, that that is what moves you to take action in social justice issues when there's injustice happening. You don't just sit with that anger and say, well, those people are horrible and I'm not going to invite them to my house and just react, but you take action, you join a movement, you set out and and find a course of something to help resolve the situation. So much more powerful than what most of us developed as we just react to the emotions. Yeah, it feels like when you're talking about that, that reactive action that you do, like grabbing a candy bar, whatever it is, it just made me think I'm sort of getting these images a lot like with the Mr. Men but uh, when you talked about the importance of creating or allowing that space with the Victor Frankl what was the the Victor Frankl quote um between stimulus and response there stimulus is a space stimulus and response there is space right and what i'm imagining is with that scenario you just described when, you know, you get angry with your boss and, and you go straight away to reach for the candy bar is that it's crushed that space. You've lost that space. And what we need to do is to just pull that back out again to allow that, that space that he talks about between the two. That's the bit that we're losing mm-hmm. and the important stuff. That's where the, a lot of the important stuff goes on in that little bubble that space that's in between the two and i think what generally happens then when we crush that space and just react we end up shutting down the emotion Mm. we don't allow it to become creative in that it moves us forward to something to resolve it to meet the actual need it just gets shut down or blunted with the self-soothing behavior or the reactive behavior and that goes back to the Sarbona. Mm-hmm. It's not seeing and her going to see her father and said the thing that she always thinks with him, she felt seen with him. And how important that is, how important that is to all of us. Mm-hmm. But that's what we're doing to ourselves. Yeah. We're not seeing ourselves. It's not seeing those emotions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So of course, as I've done recently, once I listened to this one, I I thought, well, I'm going to look up her TED talk and I'm going to look up some other things. And then of course I found her on like six other podcasts and started listening to those and similar theme. So I think she is someone that I will follow a little more closely. I like her way of talking about Mm. emotions and processing them. Yes. Very interesting. And of course I'm well, yes, I'm going to go and have to watch. I think I have seen her TED Talk. I'm sure I have, but I, I'm going to go and watch it again. The good thing about TED Talks is that they're all, whatever, they're 15 minutes or something, aren't they? So it's it's not a, a long watch. And go back and, and find out what we talked about before. This is the thing, isn't it, with, with coming back at these things from different angles. It's all very interesting because you sort of get little wisps of memory mm-hmm. from discussions before, but something new comes out of it and just refreshes your memory and just reminds you about different people you've heard speaking on subjects that you really enjoyed and you want to go and dig back into and find out more about. So thanks for that reminder. Yeah, Very interesting as always. I'm hoping that people maybe listening to this episode will even be reminded of our previous discussion of this and just bring this together with the Brene Brown pieces of emotional experiences and create that space, give themselves time to reflect and honor their emotional experiences to help us all navigate this complex world. And in the meantime, I shall be, uh, I shall email you some pictures of Mr. Men (laughs) so that you can see what I was talking about. (laughs) I hope you have a very wonderful week. Thank you. You too, Daisy, and everyone out there. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Dr. Susan David said that for her, this was really, she kind of had a 
revelation with this. <laughs> revelation. <laughs> well, I have written down revolution. <laughs> so she had a revolution, took over South Africa. 